Well, my name is Tellus Fuller. I'm one of the pastors here on staff at Grace Covenant Church, if we haven't had an opportunity to meet. And I'm really looking forward to sharing the word with you this morning. We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 23. 1 Samuel chapter 23. We're in a series that we're in now and we'll be wrapping up pretty shortly called But God. We're taking a look at places in scripture where we see God intervening into human life. Specifically places where we see a but God. We've talked about a lot of things and today we're going to look at a story from a character and a person that maybe a lot of us are familiar with named David. We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 23 verse 13 and 14. And it says this. And then David and his men who were about 600 arose and departed from Keilah. And they went wherever they could go. When Saul was told that David had escaped from Keilah, he gave up the expedition. And David remained in the strongholds in the wilderness, in the hill country of the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God did not give him into his hand. What I want to talk about for the next few minutes that we're together is just two things. One, God's presence. And two, your purpose. I want to title this message, But God, the Purpose. Will you pray with me for a minute? Lord Jesus, we love you. And God, we need you right here, right now, in this place. We affirm the authority of scripture over our lives in this moment. And we say, you have your way. Speak to us through your word. Speak to us by your spirit. God, we're your church and you are our bridegroom. We love you and we are yours and you are ours. Father, we love you so much. And more importantly, you love us. Holy Spirit, Would you empower us to live, look, and love more like Jesus today than we did yesterday? In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Amen. But God, the purpose. God's presence. I am so excited because every single time I get an opportunity to talk about the presence of God, I get ready and amped up because I truly believe that God's presence is our prize. Out of anything that we truly need, there was a message spoken earlier this year that we affirmed that the presence of God is the prize of this church. And I truly believe that your purpose is always connected to his presence. No matter where you're at, if you're looking for the purpose in your life, it will be connected to the presence of God in your life. I'm obsessed with the presence of God because I truly believe that this is one of the most unique things that followers of Jesus have. Why? Because, not because I say so, but we look in Scripture. Specifically Exodus chapter 33, and we find a story of the people of Israel coming out of Egypt after they've been enslaved for decades and generations. And as they're coming out, but before they're going into the promised land, God has a conversation with Moses. And as they've been misbehaving and not doing what God has called them to do, they're about to enter in. And God says, actually, you know what? You guys can go into the promised land, but I'm not going to go with you. I'll send an angel to go with you instead. Moses talks to God and he says, if you don't go with us, we don't want to go. He says, we would rather be in the wilderness with you than in the promised land without you. So he looks at God and he says, no, how will people know that we are distinct, that we're different? How are people going to know that you didn't just bring us out of Egypt just to have us suffer and to perish? And then God looks at Moses and he says, this is how they will know that you are mine and you are distinct from every other people group on the planet is that I will be with you. The presence of God is the most unique thing about you as a follower of Jesus. That nobody else has this thing, which is God says that he promises to be with us. The presence of God is our prize. 
You see, David in this moment, he is anointed as king, but he isn't king yet. He has the favor of God to be king, but at this point, Saul, this other man, is actually currently king. But the presence of God is with David. You see, David at this point, if you understand David, if you know a little bit of his story, this is after he has defeated Goliath. This is after he's defeated numerous enemies. This is during the time when everybody loves David in Israel. He is like the hero. They've actually even come up with a song about David. Specifically, they say, Saul, the current king, yeah, he slayed 1,000, but David, the new hero, yeah, he slayed 10,000. We like David. And what this did is that it made David feel pretty good about being the next king in Israel, but it actually angered Saul. You see, Saul, this current king, he was a disobedient and a prideful king who started off really great in God, but eventually ended very poorly. Saul, who was the king, he was threatened by David. And he was this disobedient, prideful king who saw David as a threat because people loved him and because David was next in line for the throne. But if you really consider and you know the scriptures, you know that David is not a threat to Saul's kingdom at all. You know the scriptures that David was so honoring towards God and towards Saul that Saul would throw spears at him and David would duck and then just start playing the harp again. David was so honoring towards Saul that when Saul was pursuing him, David wasn't trying to kill him. David was just running away. David was so honoring towards God and Saul that David had an opportunity to kill Saul as he was searching to kill David. And David said this, I wouldn't dare touch the Lord's anointed. David was not a threat against Saul. David was actually an asset for Saul. But Saul couldn't see it because he was prideful. He was insecure. He was threatened by what David would do. And here's the thing. David was not going to take the crown from Saul by force. But Saul was so insecure by his position that he felt threatened by David's position. You see, insecurity will have you thinking that you're acting in self-defense when it's really self-destruction. You think this thing will actually save you, but it's actually going to destroy you. Paul was, Saul was in his own demise. And he thought, because David is blessed, his blessing is a threat to my blessing. And that's what made Saul dive further and quicker into his demise than ever before is because he saw somebody else's blessing as a threat towards his own blessing. This is Saul. And so what does Saul want to do? Saul aims to go and kill David. He's chasing him around for years and years. David has a bunch of ragtag group of men, 600 around this time. And as Saul is looking to kill David, it says that God did not give David into Saul's hand. But if you look back just a few verses before in 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 7, you see that Saul is kind of delusional. Because you look and you see Saul actually says in verse 7, Oh, look at this. God has actually given David into my hand. But in reality, God has been keeping David from Saul's hand. You see, pride and insecurity will blind you to the will of God. You'll start thinking that everything is about you. Everybody's talking about you. It is all concerning you. They're thinking about you, talking about you, working towards your demise. Nobody likes you. Pride and insecurity will oftentimes blind you to what God is actually doing in the earth. And that's where Saul is. He's blind to what God is doing. But God was with David. If I could put my message in one sentence, it would be this. The presence of God is connected to the purpose of God. The presence of God is connected to the purpose of God. Why do I say that? Because you look a few chapters before in David's life. This is chapters before, but years before in 1 Samuel 16, 13, when Samuel comes to anoint the next king of Israel, and it says this, then Samuel took the horn of oil and he anointed him, David, in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of God, watch this, rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah, which means that God's purpose was for David to be king. So 
God's presence was with David. Where the presence of God is, the purpose of God is. Why? Because the presence of God is connected to the purpose of God. I don't know if you've heard it recently, but God has a purpose for your life. He has made you uniquely and distinctly to do something that only you can do. He has made you on purpose and for a purpose. That's how God sees you and designed you. And he said, I thought you so valuable that I didn't want this world without you. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. But if you want to walk in your purpose, you need to first be in his presence. You cannot walk into the purpose that God has for you without sitting in the presence of God. And at this point in the message, this is the point where if I can be totally honest with you, there is a temptation that I had as a preacher of this text. And the temptation that I have reading this text that says, David was in the wilderness hiding in the caves in Ziph, but God did not give David into Saul's hand. It like wells up like the preaching spirit in me where I want to preach this so hard. I want to preach the mess out of that verse. And I want to say things like, man, the enemy can't touch you. I want to say, you're going to become king. You got a king inside of you. If the enemy knew what was on the inside of you, he would have never messed with you. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Man, you're the anointed of God. You're blessed and highly favored. You got something on the inside of you. If the enemy knew, he would shake in his boots. Somebody shout, I'm anointed. That's what I want to say. <laughs> and I guess I said it. And I guess I just got it out of my system, right? But that's what I want to say. I want to like shout the mess out of this text. And the thing about this text and, and the, the issue that I had, the temptation that I had, is because it's not that that stuff isn't true. You are the anointed of God. You are called. You do have a purpose. You are the son of, or daughter of a king. All of that is true. It's just not 100% true. Why? Because this is David's promise, not mine. And so when I look at 1 Samuel 23 and I say, oh, well, the Lord will not deliver me into the hand of my enemy. Well, not necessarily the Lord might deliver me into the hand of my enemy. Why? Because this promise wasn't made to me. This promise was made to David. If I could teach for a second, the Bible was written for you, but it was not written to you. That matters because the Bible was written to a specific person in a specific context for a specific reason. And when the Bible was written, it was written specifically this to David, not to me. Now, that doesn't mean that this stuff isn't helpful. That just means that this stuff isn't mine. That God was specifically talking to David in this moment. He was promising David that I won't let Saul come and take you. But this is how we get mad at God is because we start to take promises out of context. And I start to claim things in scripture that are mine that were never actually for me. And I get frustrated at God because, God, you weren't supposed to deliver me into the hands of my enemy. No, no, no. He wasn't supposed to deliver David into the hand of Saul, not you. This is David's promise, not my promise. Why? Because the Bible was written not to me. It was written for me. But we know this. Like, we don't go around in scripture claiming every single promise. We're not looking at Genesis and saying, huh, your descendants will be as numerous as the stars. I'll take that one. <laughs> That's not our promise. That was for Abraham and Sarah. We, we don't look at scripture and say, if I don't cut my hair, I will have supernatural strength. No, that's Samson's promise. We don't look at Jeremiah or we ought not to look at Jeremiah and say, oh, I, before you were born, I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. No. Now, maybe, but that was Jeremiah's promise. That was Samson's promise. That was Abraham's promise, not my promise. 
Now, what I'm not saying is that we look at Scripture and don't take anything from it. I'm not saying that this, these promise, that we can't claim these promises. I'm just saying specifically that these promises can be helpful to us because not that they were made to you, but they show the character of God. So now when you look at a promise, you're not saying, oh, I'll take that one, please. You're looking at a promise, you're saying, this tells me something about who God is. Promises are no longer something that I take on demand for whatever situation in my life. They just point me to the character of God towards me. So the promises aren't tied to you. They're tied to him. And if the promises are tied to him, then we can't claim every promise, but every promise in scripture gives us a glimpse about the character of God towards us. This is David's promise, not my promise. But that doesn't mean that we can't learn from it. What I learned from this promise that God made to David is that the Lord is my rock and my salvation, and I don't need to be afraid. What I learned from this promise that God made to David is that he will never leave me or forsake me. What I learned about this promise that God made to David is that his love goes from everlasting to everlasting. What I learned about this promise that God made to David is that God has a purpose for your life. And there is nothing that the enemy can do to stop God's purpose for you. That's how we read scripture. That promise isn't mine, but the character of God towards me is mine. God has a purpose for your life. He has a purpose for your life. And this purpose for your life is not that you might be free of problems, but that you might be full of purpose. Because David was running away for his life and he was still in the presence of God. He was running in caves, hiding away. The government was after him, and God was still with David. You know what this teaches me? It teaches me that even when I'm suffering, God is still sovereign. That no matter where I'm at, the presence of God can be there. Why? Because the presence of God is connected to the purpose of God. That even when I'm uncomfortable, God is still working. Things can be uncomfortable and good at the same time. I can be in the wilderness of Ziph with Saul chasing me and still be in the will of God. Why? Because David became a man after God's own heart in the wilderness. David was formed in the wilderness. The wilderness is the shaping place for us. And the wilderness is the place that we don't want to be in. It's the place that we never thought we would be in. It's the difficult spot of our soul, of of our circumstances, or the place in our family. It's the place where I'm still kind of struggling with, and I still want to get past. It's the place where I thought that God called me to do this, but right now doesn't look like what he promised me before. The wilderness is the place where you don't necessarily want to be, but the place where God still shapes you. It's the wilderness. And the wilderness is important because oftentimes shepherds become kings in the wilderness. David, the shepherd boy, became a king in the wilderness. Why? Because God's purpose was in the wilderness. And the presence of God is connected to the purpose of God. What if you're in the wilderness and God is shaping you right now? You see, we need to be careful where we think that the presence of God isn't. Sometimes we think, no, the presence of God is not in this place, it's in that place. The presence of God, no, like, it's, 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 yeah, it's at church, that's great, cool, but like, the presence of God isn't with me or when I go or at work. But then I remember Psalm 139, and it says, where can I go from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you're there. If I grow wings and I fly to the uttermost depths of the sea, still there you are and your hand will guide me. What the psalmist is saying is that God's presence is everywhere. And if God's presence is everywhere, then that means that God's presence is here. 
Not just here at church when the worship team and the preacher and the hospitality and the word is good. Yes, the presence of God is with his people, absolutely. But we need to develop a theology of the presence of God that doesn't just say it is there, but it is here. Because oftentimes we have a theology that says, well, the presence of God is there. It's at church. It's with the preacher. It's when we're worshiping. It's with my small group. And we have this whole theology about God that says over there is the presence of God. But no, the presence of God is everywhere, which means the presence of God is here. That means the presence of God isn't just there in the function. It's here in the dysfunction. That means that the presence of God is here, actually in the setback, not just there when I reach my goals. That means the presence of God is here when I'm overwhelmed and not just there when I've got it all together. That means that the presence of God is here when parenting is much harder than I thought it would be and not just there when my kids are listening to everything I say and their many Mother Teresas. That means the presence of God is here. Because if the presence of God is everywhere, it's not just there, it's here. David's in the wilderness, and the presence of God is here. And I'm not just talking about here on this stage. I'm saying, is he welcome and you're here? When you're struggling as a parent, when you don't know what to do about the money, when you're still trying to figure out the addiction, and you still don't really know the place that you're supposed to go next. When you have these two decisions and you're at an impasse, are you inviting and welcoming the presence of God here? <laughs> David welcomed the presence here. See, because if the presence is here, then the purpose is here. If he is here, then the purpose of God is here because the presence of God is connected to the purpose of God. Have you welcomed him here? See, God's purpose for you cannot be stopped by the enemy against you. If God wants something done in your life, it's going to happen in your life. And God is saying, if you would invite my presence, you would actually be able to walk into your purpose. Saul searched for David day and night, but God did not give him into his hand. God's presence and your purpose. You see, I have some good news and I have some bad news and I have some more good news. (laughs) The good news is that God has a purpose for your life. The bad news is that the enemy wants to stop it. The other good news is that the enemy can't stop it. God has a purpose for your life. And the enemy is going to do everything he can to stop that purpose from coming to fruition. And he can't do it. It's good news, it's bad news, and it's good news. You see, David was anointed to be king. His whole purpose was to be king, anointed. That means he was consecrated, he was set apart, he was favored, he was called to it. There was a dedication about David towards being king. And Saul was doing everything in his power to make sure that that didn't happen. But God did not give David into Saul's hand. See, the purpose of God, I didn't even come up with a creative way to say it. All I wrote down was this. All I said was that uh, um, uh, (laughs) your purpose is invincible if it's in the hand of God. That's the only way I could think about it, is that your purpose is invincible if God is holding your purpose. But the issue is sometimes we are trying to hold our purpose. That we try and tell God what our purpose should be. And we inform God of how our life should go. That I'm going to get this job and live here with this type of relationship. And I'm going to have kids at this age. And they're all going to be honor roll. And obviously Ivy League D1. I'm then going to retire at this spot in that age with this few problems and this much money. And we tell God what our purpose is. But let me tell you something. If you are in Christ Jesus, your purpose is no longer your decision. You gave up that right to decide what you do for yourself. Now I decide 
to agree with what God has said over me. David was anointed to be king. That was the purpose of God for his life. And Philippians teaches us this. He says that he who began a good work in you will see it through to completion until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. That means if he began the work in me and he is going to finish the work, then he gets to decide the work. I'm not going to work according to his purpose and my strength. I can't call myself to my purpose. God gives me a purpose. And you might be sitting in this room saying, okay, you're talking all this stuff about purpose and and what God is calling you to, but I don't know my purpose. Like, I I don't know what you're to do with what you're saying. Like, okay, God gives me a purpose. I don't get to decide, but I don't even know what my purpose is. And I'll give you a piece of advice. If you don't know what your purpose is and you're following Jesus, pursue the Christian purpose. Love God, love people, make disciples. If you don't know what you're specifically called, designed, and orchestrated to do, then love God, love people, make disciples. This is the purpose that will never change, no matter if you got saved 20 minutes ago or you're Billy Graham. You're going to love God, love people, and you're going to make disciples. Why? Because if you look, there's a man who came to Jesus one time and he said, oh, teacher, what's the greatest commandment? And he wasn't really asking so that he could do whatever pleased God the most. He was asking more so in the, in the way that like, um, if you're taking a class in college and you say like, hey, um, uh, what's the attendance policy? You're not asking so that you can be at every class. You're asking to see how many classes you can miss. And so he's asking, what's the greatest commandment? He's not asking, what can I do that pleases you the most? He's saying, what do I need to do? He approaches guys and said, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus responds and he says that you should love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and your strength. And the second one is like it, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love people. Jesus said the greatest thing that I can command any believer to do is to love God and love people. And you want to know the last thing that Jesus said to his best friends before he rose into the clouds and was seated at the right hand of the Father? He looks at them in Matthew chapter 28 after he's resurrected, before he's ascended, and he says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And A, look, I will be with you always until the end of the age. If you don't know your purpose, live out the Christian purpose. Love God, love people, make disciples. Because sometimes we want to finish the work that God started in us by taking it into our own hands. When God is saying, no, 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 I started it, I'm going to finish it, and I decide what it is. When you're in Christ Jesus, your purpose is no longer your decision. (laughs) And oftentimes, our purpose can often lead us um, into opposition. If you are looking to accomplish your purpose for your life, God's purpose for your life, and you're not looking for any opposition, you're not really looking to walk in your purpose for your life. Because if you want to walk in whatever God has for you, there will be opposition against you. David experienced it. And if you go to Matthew chapter four, what we find is that Jesus at this point, now he started, his public ministry was just about to start. He had just been baptized. And as Jesus was baptized, the spirit of God descended on him like a dove. And the father spoke from heaven saying, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And then you know what the next verse says in Matthew chapter four? And the spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. What? (laughs) Jesus is baptized. He's called into ministry. And the Spirit of God leads Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. It's in Matthew chapter 4. Read it. (laughs) And you're saying, no, 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 that can't. What? But remember, the Spirit of God rested on him like a dove where the presence of God is the purpose of God is because the presence of God is connected to the purpose of God, which means that the purpose of God was for Jesus to go into the wilderness 
And if Jesus' purpose was to go into the wilderness and face opposition, what makes you think that your purpose won't face opposition? The presence of God is connected to the purpose of God. And if you're thinking, I'm going to accomplish my purpose with no opposition, with no issues, easy come, easy go, everything is going to be fine, you're not listening to the scriptures. We're not reading the Bible because Jesus was tempted and he was brought into the wilderness and he was faithful. He did not fail. He did not sin, but he did face opposition. And if you're looking to accomplish God's purpose for your life, you will face opposition. The issue is that so many times we as Christians, we believe that opposition is a sign of the devil. You know those people who think everything is the devil? I don't know why I just whispered like they couldn't hear me, right? Like, like they're in the room, shh, like don't tell them, right? But like the people who think like everything is the devil, like they trip and like it's the devil. You're like, uh, I don't know. If he wants to take you out, he might do something else, right? Like if it, you're saying, oh, it's, it's seasonal allergies, it's the devil. No, you knew this was coming. There's no milk at the grocery store, right? You're like, it's the devil. Like not everything is the devil. <laughs> something, and here's the thing, like some things, truthfully, some things are the devil. I'm not saying spiritual warfare doesn't exist. Some things are the devil, but not everything is the devil. And sometimes we have this idea that when opposition comes, it can't be God. It has to be the enemy. And if we believe that every opposition is the sign of the devil, then we will blame every difficult thing on the devil. And if we blame every difficult thing on the devil, then we will decide that every difficult thing is a sign of the devil, and we will try and prematurely escape the things that are essential to our purpose. Not every bad or difficult thing is a sign of the devil. Sometimes it's a sign that you're exactly where you're supposed to be. And don't exit prematurely because you're in the wilderness and you're saying, this is tough. This is hard. I don't know what to do. It was tough for David. It was tough for Jesus. It's tough for me. It'll be tough for you. But take heart because where the presence of God is, the purpose of God is. And if he called you to it, he will bring you through it. That is a truth that we find in scripture because God will call you to do something that only you can do connected to his purpose, not in your own own strength. Don't take the opposition as a sign that this isn't something I'm supposed to be in. Maybe if you're in the wilderness, you're exactly where you're supposed to be. If we think it's a sign of the devil, we're going to try and get out of things that God wants to grow in us. And we will start to blame everything on everything else. And we will quit prematurely. And we will lose the Christian determination that is essential for your purpose. You need perseverance to accomplish what God has for you. You need to push through the difficulty to accomplish what God has for you. And if this is a sign that you're in the wrong place because it's opposition, I would just encourage you to have a different thought that maybe you're exactly where you're supposed to be. Pastor, I'm in a cave. I'm in the wilderness. I don't know where I'm going. You're saying this is the purpose of God? Maybe. Maybe you're exactly where you're supposed to be. Because shepherds often become kings in the wilderness. And God's presence sometimes leads us into opposition. See, in the wilderness, I do believe that God was um, getting David away from Saul. I believe that. And I also believe that in the wilderness, God was getting Saul out of David. David that there were things inside of David that he couldn't take into the kingship because Israel did not need another Saul. They needed David. And David could not be David if he had not gone through the wilderness. See, Israel needed David to go through the wilderness to be king. They didn't need another Saul. 
Now, you might not have an angry, prideful, disobedient king chasing after you that wants to kill you, but you still might be in the wilderness. And in the same way that Israel needed David to go through the wilderness to be the king that he was supposed to be, your family needs you to go through the wilderness so that you can be the mom that you're supposed to be. Your family needs you. Your wife needs you to go through the wilderness so that you can be the husband that you're supposed to be. We don't need to take every sign of opposition as a sign that the devil is attacking us. No, you might not be anointed to be king, but you're anointed to be a mom. You're anointed to be a father. You're anointed to be a husband. You're anointed for reconciliation. And that's not just going to happen by ease in an easygoing life. You might have to go through the wilderness so that that you can be who you're supposed to be to the people you're supposed to be with. You might say, am I really that important? By yourself, no. But with God, absolutely. By yourself, I don't, probably not. Like you're gonna live your life, you're gonna make some money, go to school, find a wife, find a husband, have some kids, retire, make some money and go on a few vacations. Like maybe not, but with God, all of a sudden now I'm a daughter of God. I'm a co-heir with Christ. I'm an ambassador of heaven, the righteousness of God. I'm filled with the spirit of God and now I'm called to do something unique for the kingdom of God that nobody else can do besides what God has called me to do. Am I that important on my own? No, but with God you are. And he's called you to a purpose. As I close, there was this story that I found this week about this woman named Susanna Wesley. And she was this uh, woman in the 17th and 18th century that was married to a minister named Samuel Wesley. And in her life, Susanna experienced a wilderness. She, um, at this point in her life, was separated from her husband. He was far off away helping a different thing, and their marriage wasn't going well. She um, had 19 kids. Oh, my goodness. And by the end of her life, nine of them had died. They didn't have much money at this point in her life. Her husband is away, and the church that she's in currently is not going well. And Susanna Wesley gets to this place where she's in the wilderness, and she seeks the presence of God and asks God, what might you require of me here? Not there, but here. She grew up in church. Her father was a minister, and so what she decided to do is she decided to have weekly family devotionals. So what she did is she gathered her children around, and she started by singing a psalm, by reading one of her husband's or her father's sermons, and then ends with reading another psalm. She did this with her family, and over the course of time, all of a sudden, people in the community started to notice and said, hey, can we be a part of your family devotional sooner than she realized 200 people would come to her house weekly for family devotional time when she would sing a psalm, read one of her father's or her husband's sermons, and then read another psalm. And as she's in the wilderness, what happens is that she writes this letter to her husband that I want to read for us. She wrote, in your long absence, I cannot but look upon every soul you leave under my charge as a talent committed to me under a trust. I am not a man nor a minister, yet as a mother and a mistress, I felt I ought to do more than I had yet done. I resolved to begin with my own children, in which I observe the following method. I take such a proportion of time as I can spare every night to discourse with each child. Apart. On Monday, I talk with Molly. On Tuesday, with Hetty. Wednesday, with Nancy. Thursday, with Jackie. Friday, with Patty. And Saturday, with Charles. Now, the beautiful part of this story is that this woman, Susanna, had two children, specifically. Charles and John. And if 
these names sound familiar to you, John Wesley and Charles Wesley. Susanna Wesley was the mother of Charles Wesley, who was a revivalist in England and who wrote 6,500 hymns. And John Wesley, who was with him, who was the leader of the, one of the biggest revivals in all of human history. And what happened when this woman saw her wilderness and she said, I'm going to get into the presence of God and I'm not going to consider that this opposition is a sign to stop, but a sign to go. And so I'm going to start a family devotional and I'm going to pray, read a psalm, read a sermon, and read a psalm. And all of the sudden, this one woman, because she entered into the presence of God, Fought, mothered two of the most influential church revivalists that we have ever seen. Mom, don't give up. Father, don't give up. If you're a spouse in a marriage that is facing opposition, don't give up. Because what if the wilderness that you're going through might be exactly where you're supposed to be? Who knows who's in your house? Who knows what reading a psalm to your children would do? Who knows what playing a sermon for your cousin who hasn't been to church in years would do? Who knows what inviting that person who you go to work with the church time after time after time after time would do? This woman saw her wilderness and said, maybe, just maybe, the presence of God is connected to the purpose of God. And she mothered two of the most influential Christians the world has ever known. She knew that the purpose of God was bigger than the wilderness that she was in. And it wasn't going to stop her from pursuing what God had for her. You see, the reason why David was successful and accomplished his purpose, it was not because David was so capable. And it was not because Saul was so incapable. It was because the presence of God was with David. And therefore, the purpose of God was with David. And the enemy could do nothing about it. I would be remiss if we just saw this man, David, and we saw him in this beautiful story that he had, and we did not focus on the better David, the person of Jesus. Because Jesus truly is the better David. And what we see in David is this amazing story that God did not deliver him into his enemy's hands, that God actually spared David. But what we see in the gospel is that Jesus did not spare his own life. And we see the grace of God for David was being excused from suffering and from death so that David could become royalty. But what we see in the person of Jesus is that the grace of God, Jesus did not excuse himself from suffering and from death so that you could become royalty. It was David's purpose to not suffer and not die so that he could be the king that Israel needed. But it was Jesus' purpose to come and save the sinners and save the lost that he would search out in the world and said, if anybody thirsts, come to me. And I wouldn't excuse myself from suffering or from death, not so that I could become royalty, but so that you could become royalty. 2 Corinthians 5 says that God made him Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for you so that you could become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That means that the man in Jesus did not excuse himself from death so that you could have life. He's the better David and David's purpose was great. I'm happy that David didn't die. Israel needed David to be king but sadly I needed Jesus to die or else I couldn't live. And Jesus said, I know my purpose, and I love you, and I'll never forsake you, and I've loved you, and I have a purpose for you, and I would die so that you could live. And in that reality, I say, man, Jesus, God, David was great, and I'm happy, I'm so happy that you didn't, you didn't make David suffer and die, but my God, you suffered and died that I might be royalty, 
that I might be called a son and a daughter of God? It's because the presence of God was with Jesus. And the purpose of God for Jesus' life was to die so that we might live. And if you want to know your purpose, you must first understand his purpose. Where the presence of God is, the purpose of God is. Because the presence of God is connected to the purpose of God. He didn't spare himself so that you could be spared. And now I can sit here in the presence and say, God, your presence is here, not there. It's here. And where the presence of God is, I know the purpose of God is. And I don't decide my own purpose anymore. I submit to what you have for me in the wilderness here. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we love you. That you didn't spare, you didn't excuse yourself from suffering or from death so that we might be forgiven. Oh God, that we might be forgiven. There is nothing but the blood of Jesus that can wash away your sin. And he said, I find you so valuable that I would give my own life for you. If there's anyone in this room who's saying, man, I don't know that Jesus. Like, I've heard stories about him, but I don't think I know him like that. But I really want to. I want to follow him. I want to be with him. I want to be saved by him. Let me tell you, he's calling everybody in this room, whether you're far or you feel like you're close, he's saying, come. Come. He's saying, I have forgiveness for you. I have love for you. I have exhausted myself for you. If you're in this room and you're saying, man, I want to follow Jesus. Or maybe you're in this room and you're saying, man, I used to follow Jesus, but now I don't think I'm following Jesus anymore. I just want to pray for you. If you want to give your life to him, I don't know who you are, but you know who you are. If you want to give your life to Jesus, I just want you to raise your hand so I can pray with you. Whoever you are in this room, I see you. 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 Amen. If that's you, <laughs> pray this in your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, I am sorry for sinning against you. I choose to turn away from sin and to follow you. I believe that Jesus lived the life that I should have lived, that he died the death I should have died, and that he was raised again on the third day, proving that he is exactly who he said that he was, the Son of God. Holy Spirit, I invite you into my heart. Make me new and make me like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.